Well, good, up, good afternoon, brethren and sisters and young people and friends. Can I just say that Lynn and I are extremely happy to be back in Africa once again with you all and we bring greetings, of course, from our ecclesia at East Torrens in Adelaide. I'm also very gratified that whoever was responsible has chosen to look at the study of Daniel over this next few days. You'd be amazed how much we've offered Daniel and Revelation and Zechariah and how few times it's ever asked for for a special effort. So I'm very gratified that you feel confident enough to grasp hold of this very important prophecy in Daniel. What I'm going to do with this particular four studies that we have is just to give you an overview of chapter 10 to 12 and I will be leaving with whoever's responsible for the recording my PowerPoint presentation. So if you think there's too much material to take down in notes then don't be disturbed, you can get a copy from your brother that does the recording. But let's just ask the question first, why should we look at Daniel? Well, in Matthew 24 and verse 15, the Lord Jesus Christ recommended to his generation that they should very carefully understand the words of Daniel chapter 12. He said this, this was to a generation of Jews who would probably live to see AD 70 come upon that nation and the destruction of the temple of all things Jewish, the taking away into slavery of so many. He said this, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now there were three different desolations mentioned in Daniel and this was to be the third of them. There was to be the desolation that took place in the days of the Greeks which provoked the Maccabean revolt that speaks of in Daniel chapter 11. This one that Jesus referred to was to be the time of AD 70 when the Romans, having taken the city of Jerusalem, brought their legion standards into the temple and offered to their legion standards, which were of course their symbols of their gods. The warning was that the brethren and sisters who had already fled Jerusalem When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know the destruction thereof is nigh. They'd been given two years' warning to get out of Jerusalem. But many of them had gone into the the cities of Judea. And Jesus said, when you see that abomination of desolation in the holy place, then you know it's time to get out of Judea as well. And those who understood what Daniel was talking about fled Judea, and as our hymn very beautifully says, they alone to Pella fled. They went across to the other side, to Gilead and to other places that they might escape. The roundup, the Romans then put through the land and capturing people and destroying people after AD 70. So the warning was there if they understood Daniel. If they understood what Jesus was talking about, then they would flee. So Jesus said it's important to understand Daniel. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Another reason to study Daniel is that God loves those who have a desire to understand the visions of God. You know, Daniel received this vision of Daniel 10 to 12 because of the fact that he was chastening himself, because of the fact that he wanted to understand the purpose of God. The time had come for the decree of Cyrus and Cyrus had now come back to the city of Babylon to take the throne. And with Cyrus on the throne, Daniel realised from the words of Isaiah that the time had come for the restoration of the Jews. And he set his heart to understand and to know the meaning of the times. And after three weeks delay, what we have in Daniel 10 to 12 was his reward. But I want you to notice in both those passages on the screen, in Daniel 9 and in Daniel chapter 10, on two separate occasions, years apart, that the angel said to Daniel, O man, greatly beloved, for thou art greatly beloved. And that was not just the opinion of God, that was the opinion of the angelic host as well. And you think in the days of Daniel, when the nation was not in the land of Israel anymore, where else in the world, where else in the creation would the the interest of God and his angels be so focused if it were not around Daniel? He was the leading exponent and proponent of the things of God that was left in the world. And there was tremendous interest of the angels about Daniel. And he was to them a man greatly beloved. Why? 
Well, because he set his heart to understand. And that's why God loved him so much. His burning interest to know. You know, there are two good reasons why we should give ourselves to understand the prophecies of the Bible. A negative reason and a positive reason. Brother Thomas very beautifully said, no one has the right to set up his own ignorance as the limit of what God has revealed. You know, sometimes we say, well, that all sounds too complicated. I don't need to know about it because it's too complicated for me. Well, God's put it there. As Brother Thomas goes on to say, the best we can do is to say, I don't understand it yet, but I will give diligence to understand it. I will try and understand it. And we have to go after the mind of God. We have to seek and to, and to hunger and to thirst after the things of God. Because Jesus said, unto you, unto the disciples, it is given to know the mysteries or the secrets, the divine secrets of the kingdom of heaven, which are hid from the world. And we have the key, we have the gospel, we have the promises, we have the hope of Israel. And we have all the helps that God has given us that we might understand these glorious prophecies that are in the Bible. We just need to take the trouble to investigate these things. Now I might have said it before here but I'll say it again. This is my favourite quote from the pioneers. You know, Brother Thomas makes a beautiful point in Phanerosis, page 38, and he says this, The deity delights in stimulating the intellect of his creatures. God conceals things in his word. God makes things interesting. God uses a whole variety of revelation. And you think about it, prophecy, psalms, history, life stories, all kinds of revelation we have in the Bible, parables, symbolism, poetry, wisdom. And God does all this different way of recording his purpose and his understanding that we might be stimulated in our brains. And God wants us to use our brains, expand our brains and to keep growing in the things of the truth. No person, no matter how intelligent, how learned, will ever exhaust understanding the word of God. And God wants us to be on that upward spiral to understand more. And God loves to stimulate the intellect of his creatures. You know, the great men of the Bible who were given these amazing prophecies and all the symbolism with them had a burning desire to understand. You know, John says, he went much because no one opened the book of seals. Zechariah, his first six chapters are peppered with questions of the, of the communicating angel. What are these, my Lord? Why this? Why that? Who are these? Where are they going? And you see, there was that great interest to understand the things of God that God rewarded Zechariah with revelation after revelation because of his interest. And we must have that same burning desire and keep asking questions. Why? What does that mean? But perhaps most of all, brethren and sisters, why we study the book of Daniel today. You know, Daniel chapter 12 is written primarily for us in the last few verses. Daniel is told, seal up the book, Daniel, you'll go to your rest, you'll stand on your lot at the end of days. But the last part of Daniel 12 is written for this generation. And it says this, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And that certainly is a description of our age, isn't it? The wicked shall do wickedly. They'll go on doing exactly what the wicked do. And none of the wicked shall understand. When the day comes that God moves in the earth, they will be taken by great surprise. As a thief in the night, it will come to the world. As pain upon a woman with child. Suddenly, unexpectedly, disastrously for them. Great fear. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after the things that are coming. And they won't have a clue what it's all about. But the wise shall understand. And that's why, brethren and sisters, we, above all people, need to be familiar with the prophecy of Daniel. The wise shall understand the meaning of these things. Now, Daniel himself was quite a remarkable individual. It's not our proposal to study the character of Daniel very much. But just to summarise what we know about Daniel, an excellent spirit was found in him. That was the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar's wife. A sure grip on the hope of Israel. And it goes through chapter 9. It's all about the promises that God made concerning his people. 
an understanding of visions and dreams right from boyhood. He was noted for that. In his own generation, says Ezekiel, along with Noah, Daniel and Job, these three men who saved others by their intercession and their righteousness and their praying for others, that was written of Daniel in his own generation in the time of Ezekiel 14. He was a legend in his own time when it came to his prayers and a constant desire to understand the visions of God. Again and again, God rewards him with understanding in the visions of God. As to his age, well, there's just a brief summary of the age timelines of Daniel. Starting at the age of 17 when he was taken captive, the king's dream and the fiery furnace followed very soon after him arriving in Babylon. He was still a young man in those days. Then we trace him right down to the last vision when he was 90 years of age, the vision of the man of one. The first year of Cyrus, of the sole reign of Cyrus, Darius had of course taken the kingdom and reigned for two years. This was the first reign, or the first year, the sole reign of Cyrus over the kingdom of Persia. And it was that year, of course, that the decree of Cyrus was made. It was also the year, we believe, that Daniel died. So he's right at the end of his life when he receives this last vision. And the reason why he was praying for three weeks, why he was mourning and fasting was that he knew the time had come. He understood by reading the works of Jeremiah and Isaiah that 70 years were accomplished from the destruction of Jerusalem. He understood from Isaiah that a man called Cyrus would rise up to make the decree and there he was on the throne. And that's why it says in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, which was actually his first year of sole rule. Cyrus had been going on to complete the conquest of the Babylonian Empire while Darius remained there for two years. But it was now the third year of Cyrus, it was the first year of sole rule in Babylon. And he was now in a position to make the decree that Daniel had been waiting for. And so Daniel prays and he prays and he prays and there's no answer for three weeks. And so this aged man is praying and the angel in the end apologises to Daniel for the delay. We'll look at that tonight, God willing. Around this time, we start to see the pattern of the book of Daniel. You know, Brother Thomas said this, in taking a general survey of the contents of the book of Daniel, it may be seen that two great powers are the principal subjects of its predictions. And you see this from the time you go back to Daniel 2 with the image, right through all the prophecies of Daniel 7, 8, 9, 10 and 12 and the battle is between two great powers one is styled the kingdom of men sorry about the typo and the other the kingdom of God the kingdom of men versus the kingdom of God and even though successive governments, successive nations successive empires have passed across the world scene, from God's view it's all the one and same kingdom the kingdom of men And it's in contest with God's intention which will be victorious in the end of the establishment of the kingdom of God. That's what the book of Daniel outlines to us, this battle between the two kingdoms. Now when we come to Daniel chapter 10, we can divide the chapter quite easily. In verse 1 to 3 we have Daniel's prayer for understanding. Verse 1 is a summary verse of the whole process. It's what he wrote on reflection when he thought about Daniel 10 to 12. But he tells us in verse 2 and 3 why the vision came. It was because he was mourning. He was now wondering why there was still a delay, Cyrus having come to the throne, why there was still not the decree of Cyrus being issued. And so he mourned and he prayed for three weeks for understanding. And God saw that. But the angels were involved very much elsewhere. Finally in verse 4, on the 4 and 20th day of the first month. So he's mourned right through Passover. Finally, on the 24th day of the first month, Daniel gets his answer and it comes in the form of a dramatic vision that he sees, the vision of the man of one. Verse 7 to 9, he goes through a symbolic death followed by a resurrection, a judgment, an approval process and at the end of the chapter we have a little summary on the work of the angels that we'll deal with tonight. We want to just talk about taking Daniel through this first vision he sees. As we said, the decree of Cyrus was the thing that was troubling his mind. He was saying, surely the time has come for the restoration of the people of God. 
He was very keen for that and we know from history that when the time came and Cyrus was on the throne, that Daniel appeared to him and explained to him the prophecies of Isaiah. The prophecies of Isaiah 44 and 45 where it says that Cyrus, a man called Cyrus would rise up, who would be Yahweh's shepherd, Yahweh's anointed, Yahweh's Messiah is what Cyrus is called in those prophecies. And that he would issue the decree to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And that's why Daniel had been praying. And as a result of this particular vision, Daniel then was put in front of Cyrus and the decree was made just before Daniel's death. This last prophecy of Daniel is one continuous prophecy from chapter 10 and verse 5, or verse 4, right through to chapter 12 and verse 13. Can I just say that sometimes in our Bible as we have it, the chapter divisions are sometimes extremely unhelpful. We need to remember that chapter divisions are not part of the original text except in the Psalms. Chapter divisions were put in by the translators to make the Bible readable in easy chunks and they put them wherever they thought they should best go but they often made a very bad mistake in putting the chapter division in the wrong place. And our habit of reading chapter by chapter has exacerbated the problem. We always need to ask the question, is the chapter division necessary or is it in the wrong or right place? And you will find lots of examples where the flow of thought is destroyed by the chapter division. A classic one is between 2 Corinthians 6 and 7 and there are lots of others. Now, in this particular case, there should be no chapter division between chapter 10 and the end of chapter 12. It's actually one continuous vision and explanation that is given to Daniel. It starts and it ends with the man of the one being the appropriate figure. We have him in chapter 10 verse 5. Looked it up mine eyes and behold and looked a certain man. If you've got an AV margin it says the one man. We'll talk more about him in a moment. But there is the appearance of a man that starts off the vision. When we come to chapter 12 and verse 5 As the vision begins to close, chapter 12 and verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side the bank of the river, and one on that side the bank of the river, the same river we have in chapter 10, and said to the man clothed in linen, and that's exactly the same man that you see back in chapter 10, he finishes the vision in chapter 12 with an oath on behalf of God. So that's a very important link to see this is one continuous vision that goes through to the end of chapter 12. And what it does, it gives us the relevant history of the world that is relevant to the purpose of God, relevant to the people of Israel from the time of Daniel down to the time of the end. So we're getting two and a half thousand years of history in these three chapters that was revealed to Daniel. Let's just pick up verse 1 to look at the heading of the chapter. As we said, the first year of Cyrus's sole reign over the kingdom of Persia. It says... A thing was revealed. This is a summary verse of what he saw in these three chapters. A thing was revealed. The thing was true. Now the idea of true is the word emeth. You know, God is a God of mercy and truth. It means God's total reliability. The fulfilment is sure, says Daniel. What I saw, I know it will come to pass. It's true. But he says... And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. But the but in the verse says, it's true, it will come to pass, but the time appointed was long. You know, that little phrase there is much better translated as the RV translates it, the warfare was long. Rotherham has a great warfare. It's true, it will happen, but there's a great warfare yet to come. And you see, the impression that was given to Daniel when he received this vision was there were going to be hundreds and thousands of years ahead of him that the people of God and the saints of God would be trodden down and trodden underfoot and persecuted and be the subject of of nations going over their territory back and forward for two and a half thousand years this would go on and the overall impression to Daniel was well I know God will do it but why does it have to be so long in fact in Daniel chapter 12 even the angels are saying How long to the end of these things? And it's this great long warfare that we're going to talk about in the next few studies. And that's what Daniel 10 to 12 is about. So the warfare was long. Now Daniel prayed. 
When we come to verse 2 and verse 3, we read that he was mourning, he was fasting for three weeks. When you go over the page to verse 12, you find the angel noticed this. On the first day you set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard and I am come for thy words. So it wasn't just fasting for the sake of fasting. He was in deep prayer for understanding. Where was the purpose of God now going that Cyrus was on the throne? And of course Daniel was a man that we note for his prayers. He prayed with his friends when they were threatened by the king in chapter 2. He thanked God for the revelation they were given concerning the image. He prayed three times a day, even though he was cast into the den of lions for doing so. And he prayed for Israel in chapter 9, and the most glorious inclusive prayer, we have sinned, we have failed, included himself in their failures, and again was rewarded with the 70 weeks prophecy. And now he prays for understanding of these things. At the end of the vision, he's still praying for understanding of these things. And God loves that spirit, that spirit of prayer, where we go to God and we say, please help me understand your will and your revelations. So Daniel prayed. And what he got in response was the appearance of the man of the one. This is what he saw. The margins we said says, in the AV, it says Hebrew one man. It's actually the one man. And the translators, not really knowing the import of that, just put in a certain man, thinking it was a particular person. Well, it was a particular person, but not a real person. This is a vision. And you've got to understand with the book of Daniel that what Daniel sees is a vision. It might be a a roaring sequence of beasts. It might be a terrible image hit by a stone. It might be a ram and a goat butting heads. But always, when the vision is over, there is an explanation of what the vision actually means. And every vision is like that in Daniel. A vision, a prayer for understanding and an explanation comes. And this is no different. So what we have is a vision that is given to Daniel. It's a vision of this certain man, or as Brother Thomas calls him, the man of the one eternal spirit. You might remember the words of Brother Thomas when he said, you know, God manifestation, not human salvation, was the grand purpose of the eternal spirit. God intended to enthrone himself in a race of people upon the earth, everyone who shall be spirit, because born of spirit. And the whole plan of God with this earth, and this is what we must get out of this study on Daniel 10 to 12, is that God has created this world, yes, to fill it with his glory, but the purpose and the way of doing that is developing a race of people like himself. And this man of the one is the representation of the the ecclesia of God, the saints of God, the people of God that God is developing. And they are the reason why history is there. They are the reason why history will unfold. Because in the end, God will have developed a people like himself who will then bring the rest of the world on board in the millennium until everybody is like God that remains alive. You know, God didn't make a world because it's a beautifully created world. It's a platform for the development of a people that God wants to be like himself, to expand his own glory. And that's why we have this man of the one right at the front of the vision, the completed Christ body made up of all the redeemed saints. And it's the exact opposite of what Daniel 2 showed about the kingdom of men. We'll come to that more in a moment. It is what we call the heraldry of the kingdom. Now heraldry is what we very simply call flags. I don't know what your South African flag has on it, but our Australian flag has the Southern Cross, it has the British Union Jack because of our British origins, but we have the Southern Cross, which of course indicates our place in the Southern Hemisphere. Other nations are more clear. Canada has a maple leaf. Many nations, very, very easy to work out from their flags what nation it is. Israel's flag we know implicitly with the Star of David. So heraldry is a representation of a kingdom. And God's heraldry started in the Garden of Eden with the cherubim. And it comes down through this figure, the man of the one. Let's just say a few things about the man of the one. It's very normal for God to start a prophecy or a revelation with the final completed picture in the imagery. 
Why did God put a cherubim in the Garden of Eden when man had just fallen into mortality? Because there in front of them, at the cherubim that they saw at the east of the garden, protecting the way of of the tree of life, there was a representation of the kingdom of God and the qualities of those who would go into it. So God gave them a heraldry, a flag, a representation of his kingdom right back in Genesis chapter 3. And you can go through many prophecies in the Bible. God gives you the final picture in symbology and then he gives you the unfolding story that leads to it. Not like the books that we read where you build up to the final chapter and the plot is solved in the final chapter. What God does, he says, here's the the end of the story in symbol and now I'll tell you how we get there. So in Daniel chapter 10 we have the man of the one. Then we have two and a half thousand years of history as to how we get there. In Revelation chapter 1 it starts off with the vision of the one like the Son of Man. It's not a picture of Christ. It's a one Christ body that's like him. It's his brethren. It's to all of those that make up the body of Christ, all individual members from every age, from all countries. God is calling us in to be the one body of Christ like unto the Son of Man. And the qualities of those immortal beings are shown in Revelation chapter 1. Then we have the history unfolded. In Revelation 4 we have the the rainbowed throne and the glassy sea, a picture of the millennium in full swing. And then we go back and we open up the history to see how we get there. Revelation 10, the same thing with the rainbowed angel. goes right back to the French Revolution to see how we get there. Revelation 15, the saint singing the song of Moses. And then we have the lead up to Armageddon. Revelation 19, we have the end of the millennium described to us. And then we have chapter 20 that tells us what happens at the end of the millennium. And, And we have all this vision given up front and then explanation given afterwards. And that's the way God reveals himself. We need to see that pattern through the Bible. And Daniel 10 is no different. We have here a representation of the saints in the kingdom of God as the one body of Christ. And we have that right at the front of this vision. So let's just make a few notes about symbology. As we said, the deity delights in stimulating the intellect of his creatures. God doesn't make it easy. I'm sorry if that bothers anyone. The modern age is all about making things simple and if people can't easily understand it, they say, well, it's all too hard and walk away. God doesn't do that. God says, I know that you can rise to the occasion. I want you to get your brains working. He therefore reveals himself to them mysteriously because he wants us to seek and to knock and to ask. God excites and expands our minds in the process. Symbols are great aids to the memory. Why did Jesus use parables? Because stories are better remembered than just outlining principles on their own. The listener had to go away and to ponder the meaning and to try and find. You know, Jesus only on two occasions ever explained the meaning of a parable. Normally people had to think about it and go home and ponder it and debate it. And in the process they convicted themselves of the meaning of the parable. Pictures are easily retained. Anyone having studied the beasts in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8 has a glorious picture of rams and goats smashing into each other and horns flying everywhere of great and terrible beasts coming out of the sea and devouring people. And pictures are easily retained. And God has concealed spiritual gems that we must try and understand. It's our honour to seek them out, says the Proverbs. Now the first imagery we saw, of course, was the cherubim. Back in the Garden of Eden, God gave them this winged, four-faced representation of his kingdom. And Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel were expected to look at that and to understand the principles that would get them into eternity. And you might think to yourself, well, that would be difficult without the Bible as we have it to explain the symbols. But they were expected to look at animals that they saw in the creation and to work out the meaning of the symbology in a spiritual plane. Now that was challenging when you had no Bible as a background. But they had the angels to talk to and ask questions of and I think that would have been the way that they would have had to learn. But they were given that. Now there's the coat of arms of Australia. It didn't take much to work that out, did it? Because there's two animals on there that don't live anywhere else in the world except Australia. But inside that there's the heraldry of the seven or the six states of Australia. 
And that takes a little more working out, doesn't it? But you see, all of that is a representation. You can go into the detail of what is the plant behind there. Well, it's a wattle tree, which is the national plant of Australia. And that's a very, very simple heraldry. Some of the British ones are astounding. It takes you weeks to work them out. But everything in that, that heraldry is symbolic of something to do with the background of that nation. So you see, God is putting up in the man of the one the heraldry of his kingdom. It was first represented as the cherubim, and now we have it in a, in a more developed phase in Daniel chapter 10 and in Revelation 1. Now look at this. In Daniel 10 and Revelation 1, we have a very similar pattern. The man of the one, in Revelation, he's called the one like the son of man, clothed in linen, clothed with the garment. And of course, it was a linen garment if you check in Revelation. Learns loins girt with gold, girt with a golden girdle. Face as lightning, face shining as the sun. Eyes as lamps of fire, eyes as flame of fire. Feet of brass, feet of brass. Voice as a multitude, voice of many waters. Hair pure like wool. And we can pick up details about the man of one from chapter 7 where we have the same representation. And it also corresponds to Revelation. So there's no doubt we're seeing the same thing. It's like two different people. If two different people saw this vision and their reports were there, then they wouldn't be precise. There would be different things that would impress and John and and Daniel have slight variations, but it's the same representation they saw. And Daniel had it to open the vision which leads to the time of the end and so did John. So why does God open both Daniel 10 to 12 and the revelation with this representation of one like the Son of Man? Well, as we said, it's the counterbalance to the kingdom of, of men. We're quite familiar with the, the Daniel's image, which represents the successive kingdoms finally being destroyed at the toe stage by the stone power of Christ. I think we all know that story fairly well. But when you put it alongside of the man of the one, there you have the kingdom of God represented by a terrible, fearsome warrior. And that's been the nature of the kingdom of men. His countenance was terrible, says Daniel. The attributes are the power of the flesh. But when you come to the man of the one, it's an angelic-like figure. Its qualities are very, very specific to the work of the completed body of Christ and what they will do in the future. So there we have what this is about, the contest between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. One a terrible figure, one a godly figure, one like the Son of Man. And they represent the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men in their turn. Now, did you notice in verse 4 of Daniel chapter 10, and if you can quickly flick over to Daniel 12 and verse 5, that this man, or verse 6 of Daniel 12, this man is actually over a river. So Daniel lifts up his eyes in chapter 10, verse 4. He was by the side of the river, which is Hiddekel. I lifted up my eyes and behold a certain man clothed in linen. So he looks up and this man is above the river. In both those visions, at the start and the end of it, he's above the river. But what river is it? Now it's interesting. It is the river Hiddekel. In both cases, 50 miles from the capital. We might say, what is Daniel doing 50 miles away from his normal place of work and abode? Well, God's brought him there because he wants to tie this back to Genesis chapter 3. What was the river in Genesis chapter 3? By which the cherubim stood. It was the river Hedekel. It bound the sides of the Garden of Eden and the river went out past the Garden of Eden. And so at the east of the garden, that's where the river Hedekel flowed. So we have something here that's connecting us back to Genesis. And when we come to chapter 12, we're going to explain the symbology of the river Hedekel and its particular meaning that we see in Daniel 12. So he's over that river. What we have here is something that is tracing the path of history. And the river, I'll just give you that clue, the river is the winding course of human history that is shepherded on either side by the two mighty angels but is guided in its destiny by the man of the one. Let me explain that to you. So we have this symbolic man. He represents the saints from all ages that will make up the first fruits of God in the kingdom and he also represents those who at the end of the thousand years will become part of that great immortal company. And he's symbolised by a man standing over a river. The river representing the course of history 
the glorified saint community dictates that course of history. Everything God brings to pass in the earth is with the object of finishing, perfecting, guiding and purifying that holy people. That's what God is about. You know, when you think about it, did Jesus Christ come into the world to save himself? Would Jesus have come if there had not been a saint community to be saved? Probably not. Our pioneer brethren make that point. He would not have been here were it not for our need. The earth itself, God could have made a perfect earth. It would have shown what a wonderful creator he was, but he wanted a much better thing than a perfect, beautiful earth. He wanted people who would be like himself by free choice. And that's a great creation. That's what this world exists for. The earth is only a platform for that purpose. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ was the key pivotal part of that to make it possible. But he came that God might perfect the man of one. And that dictates the whole course of human history. That's why he's over the river in both the beginning and the end of the vision. All things, says Paul, are for your sakes. Fear not, little flock, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The salvation of the saint community, that they should become God manifest in the earth, is the grand purpose of the eternal spirit. And we need to see that. You know, it's not difficult to understand why this vision starts with a symbolic man of one because he is a representation of the kingdom of God and why God is working in the earth in the way that he is. Now let me just make it clear that the man of the one is not a literal person. There is not an individual that has all these qualities. It is a representative symbol for the glorified ecclesia. You know, eyes like fire, face like lightning, hair like wool, wouldn't quite fit our image of the perfect person. This is not a real person. This is a representation that Daniel was shown to represent the qualities of the saint community. It's a teaching mechanism, not an alien of some sort. Okay, let's just quickly explain what we see in the attributes of the symbolic man of the one. I'm not going to go off and give any detail on these because you can search them out for yourselves. They're not hard to find the references for them. A man clothed firstly in linen. Linen, of course, in the Bible is the garments that we get at baptism that we have to wash weekly in the blood of the Lamb and which will be turned into garments of righteousness and immortality with the coming of Christ. Revelation 19, verse 7, Unto the bride has been given unto her clean linen, fine, clean linen, fine as, which is the righteousness of the saints. And that will become immortal garments as we so often see the angels clothed in white. So white linen is immortality and righteousness that has been imputed to us. The girdle of fine gold, faith perfected by trial. You know, Job said, at the end of my trials, I know I shall come forth as gold. And that, of course, is the purpose. You can make a note of Daniel 10, 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white, says Daniel. Purification, sorting out of our characters is what God is about. And that is seen by the girdle of fine gold. The beryl. You know, the beryl is a blue-green stone. The colour of heaven relates to Revelation 4, the green rainbow in Revelation 4. The eighth stone in the breastplate, eight being the number of the resurrection. So again, the meaning of Beryl is resurrection to be king priests. The face like lightning, radiance, powerful, destructive to the wicked. You know, lightning is always something that is, is very, very powerful when it hits. And they radiate that. The eyes of fire, intelligence and perception. Nothing will be hid from them. You know, the eyes of God run to and fro through the earth. The eyes of Yahweh in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And this is the work of the angels today. This will be the work that we will take over from the angels. The eyes of Yahweh run to and fro through the whole earth. And there is the perception and the intelligence that God has and will give to us. Eyes of fire. Feet of brass. And of course it's always polished brass. Been through the fire, now perfected by trial. Treading down the wicked. Bringing Armageddon to the earth. The sheaves ready for threshing. And the voice 
It's always a voice like great waters, a voice of many voices. And it emphasizes the multitudinous aspect of the body of Christ. Many, many saints from all different languages and tongues speaking the words of God and spreading the gospel of the age. So there we have a very simple composite picture of what the man of the one is about. As I said, you could follow every one of those off and make an exhortation out of them individually. But let's just take the overview. It's a representation of what the Christ body will do and what they will be like in the day of their immortality. And that's what the man of the one represents. Daniel, here's the end of the picture. Now let me give you the details. Well, the obvious question is, how do we get to be part of that perfected body of Christ? And that's where the record now takes us. And the rest of this chapter is incredibly simple. We're going to leave out verse 13 and verse 20 to 21 for tonight's study. But simply this is the how process of how we get to be part of the man of the one. The process by which mortals will become immortal. And to show that to Daniel and to every saint down through the ages, Daniel is taken through a physical experience, a parable, of the resurrection and judgment process. And Daniel goes through that at the hand of Gabriel. Now, this next section that goes from Daniel chapter 10 and verse 7 through to Daniel 10 and verse 19, this section is portraying what we read again in Daniel chapter 12. Let's just go there. Daniel 12 and verse 1, At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince that stands for the children of thy people, And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now I want you to notice that the angel in chapter 12 is describing literally the events at the time of the end, the resurrection process. Do you notice there in chapter 12 and verse 1 it says, the great prince that stands for the children of thy people. And then he says, at the same time, thy people shall be delivered. Now, we need to notice that there are two different peoples that the book of Daniel is concerned with. Daniel is a member of both of them, but not everybody is. Now, these are the peoples that we find in the book of Daniel. Daniel's people, where it says the children of thy people in chapter 12 verse 1, are the children of the Jews, the children of Israel, the people of the land, Jerusalem and thy people, Daniel says in his prayer, the city and thy people that are called by thy name. This is the Jewish nation he was praying for, the sin of my people Israel. And he had identified it himself very closely with the people of Israel. So Daniel was a member of the race of the Jews who were Daniel's people. They were God's people, but they were Daniel's people. And he was very concerned for the fate of the Jews. He loved the Jews and their promises. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. You see that this is Daniel's people. And the great prince in chapter 12 verse 1, Michael, and we'll talk more about him later on, he stands for the children of thy people. It will be the, the impending destruction of the nation of Israel that brings Christ into the public revelation in the world. Armageddon is Christ rescuing the Jews from imminent destruction. And he will stand up and he will take them out of the clutches of the Roman bear, or the Russian bear, sorry. And he will, he will just do that and take them away. He will stand for Daniel's people in the latter days. So that's Daniel's people and Daniel was a member of that nation. But he was also the member of a different people. The people of the saints. And the book of Daniel very clearly dis- defines between thy people thy people of the holy city, thy people called by God's name and the people of the saints of the most high. And we need to see there are two different peoples here because in in chapter 12 and verse 2 many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will not be Jews. They will be Daniel's people of the saints of the most high. The saints of the most high will be trodden down by the papacy, says Daniel 7 until finally judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. Yes, they will include many Jews, but they will include many non-Jews as well. The people of the saints of the Most High possess the kingdom. 
And we find in the book of Daniel that there are two distinct peoples. Daniel is a member of both classes. And God is trying to get him to see that it's the second class that he's most interested in. Even though Israel is the apple of God's eye, even though Israel is the nation through which God makes a witness to the world, it is the people of the saints of the Most High that are of most concern to God. That's why the vision starts with the man of the one and ends with the man of the one. Daniel is praying for the restoration of the temple. God says, get a bigger picture, Daniel. It's all about the development of the saint community. Yes, I will save Israel in due time. But it's about the saint community that I'm most interested in. Thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that is found written in the book, says Daniel 12 and verse 1, and that is the book of life. And you see there's two different classes of people we need to appreciate in Daniel in the whole prophecy. So with that appreciation, let's now look how the saints inherit the kingdom. And this section is very straightforward, as I said. You may not get all this down, but you will be able to get a copy of this from your brother that does the the taping in your ecclesia. Let's just move straight into it. I'm going to set it out in this section as a, a simple understanding of the process of resurrection, judgment, glorification. So the first stage is our corruptions. This is where we are now. This is where what will happen to us if we fall into death. And Daniel having been shown that there is many hundreds of years stretching ahead, knows he will go into the grave. So he goes through a physical experience to outline the process of corruption, resurrection, examination and glorification. First stage is in a deep sleep. Of course we know that the Bible says those that sleep and the dust of the earth shall arise. He has his face toward the ground. He's rightly related to death. His comeliness is turned into corruption. I'm sorry this got a bit out of line somehow. The flesh corrupts away. He retained no strength and that's the weakness of mortality, isn't it? As we get older we know what that's like. You have to think twice about how you're going to get out of the chair. You know, everything in life you have to think how you're going to do it because your bones and your muscles are not as strong as they used to be. You heard a voice and the voice of the archangel will say to those who sleep in the dust of the ground, come forth. So very simply, what happened to Daniel in that process that he was there? You know, it says in verse 7, he was left alone. None of the men with him saw or heard the vision, saw the vision of the man of the one and there was no strength in him and he now was taken through a physical resurrection process. So firstly he's as good as dead. He's in the state of corruption. Then we have the resurrection. A hand touched me. It's going to be one of the great blessings of the resurrection to have the angels present to bring us forth out of the grave. Many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And you can just see the hand rousing him from sleep. Set me on my knees. We're going to be confused and bewildered, aren't we, at the time of the resurrection. The angelic reassurance Fear not. I want you to just quickly come to Psalm 71. You know, there's a beautiful verse here that David wrote when he thought about the day of the resurrection. Psalm 71. Let's pick it up in verse verse 20. Thou, O God, which hast showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You know, there's faith in the resurrection, isn't it, in the Old Testament. But he thought about what it would be like coming out, confused and bewildered. You know, you imagine trying to catch up with what's happened to my family, what's happened to my nation, what's happened to the world since I've been in the grave. What lies ahead with me in in the judgment that is now coming? Where's my family? And all the things that need to be explained to people when they are raised from the dead. Look at verse 21. Thou shalt increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. We're going to need that comfort, brethren and sisters, and that's why the angels are sent forth to gather the elect from the four winds of the earth. We'll be worried, we'll be confused, we'll be concerned, perhaps feeling very guilty and inadequate. And all of those feelings are valid. And that's why the angels will be there. So back in Daniel chapter 10, Fear not, 
And then there is a level of commendation. Of course, we're dealing here only with the righteous. We're not here with the fate of the wicked. This is only concerning the righteous. Some comfort to the righteous. O man, greatly beloved, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. From the first day you set your heart to understand, I was watching. And so the resurrection continues. He says to him in verse 11, stand upright and will be given strength that we might go through the process of examination at the judgment seat of Christ. We won't come out of the grave in the same mortal condition we went into it. Perhaps with Alzheimer's disease or some terrible affliction that caused us to die. We'll come out sufficiently strengthened to participate actively and fully in the process of judgment and examination. But we will first stand trembling, very conscious of our mortality, in the presence of an angel of God, our face toward the ground, coming home to us, the consciousness of our weakness, our unworthiness to be in the kingdom, and dumb, quite unable to speak. What are we going to say to God now that all of those things that he actually said would happen, have happened, How can we explain our weaknesses and our failures? Well, we'll be given that strength. And so we come to the process of examination. One like the Son of Man. Of course, Jesus says, I have the power to judge because I am the Son of Man. Perhaps this is referring to the angel. That will be one of the angels of the Lord Jesus Christ sent for us. They are obviously like the Son of Man because they're all like God. But the final judge, of course, is Jesus himself. And then we are touched in the lips. You know, Daniel's mouth was opened. We'll be able to give an account of ourselves under God. You know, it says in Romans chapter 14, Why do you judge your brother? Why do you set at naught your brother? For you shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And Daniel has been stood upon his feet. It is written, as I live, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And the process of judgment will involve us with the angel going over our lives and the things that we should have learnt and could have learnt. Given power to recollect. We will get back memory of those things where we failed to learn. And the angel will review that with us. And we shall give an account of ourselves to God. I opened my mouth and I spake. And what did Daniel say? Well, the judgment process is about the motivations, isn't it? It says, this is Weymouth's translation, every man will openly disclose the motives that have been in people's hearts. You know, the judgment seat of Christ is not that God might find out whether we're suitable for the kingdom. He already knows that. He knows what names are in the book of life. I know thy work, says Jesus. He doesn't need to find out, but we do. And it's perhaps only when our motives are fully disclosed that we'll understand how God really sees us. So, you know, the judgment seat is very much for our benefit. My sorrows are turned upon me. And the more the process of examination goes on, how inadequate we will feel. There's no breath in me. What more can we say? Utter humility. Standing in the divine presence, our face to the ground, ashamed when we understand how much we failed to live up to God's ways. I have retained no strength. And there will be, for all of us, a complete sense that we are flesh. That in our flesh dwells no good thing. And we're not worthy of eternal life. That's the sort of people that God will finally make immortal. Vessels of his mercy, says Ephesians 2 and verse 7. And this is why we're put through that process. You know, at the end of the process of examination at the hand of the angel and then finally before Christ, we will see ourselves for what we really are. It says in the Bible, we shall, we shall know ourselves as we are known. It's for our benefit we put through that process. We will end up feeling totally unworthy and so we should. We will be revealed openly to others. Those dark, unconfessed secrets that we thought we got away with in front of men will be shouted from the housetops. 
The time for confession is now. We will see our total dependence on God's mercy. But like Daniel, we trust we will be amazed at the grace of God to still give us entrance to the kingdom. And if we are, how fitted we will be for the role of the priesthood of the age to come. Every priest, says God, is taken from among men that he might minister for God in things pertaining to men, that he might have compassion on the ignorant and those that are out of the way. And our consciousness of how unworthy we were, and yet God still saved us, will equip us totally for the work of the kingdom, of bringing the rest of the world to become part of the man of the one. And so the process will be completed. Glorification. One touch me. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. He strengthened me. They shall change their strength, says Isaiah 40, verse 28. No longer powered by food and blood, but energised by the Spirit of God and the commendation. O man, greatly beloved, come ye beloved of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Fear not, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, said Jesus. And we will experience that incredible joy. Peace be unto you. God does love you. God has made you his sons. You are the bride for his son. And that complete unity with God. Be strong, yea, be strong. And we shall be changed. And I was strengthened, says Daniel. This mortal shall put on immortality. And then the angel says, Daniel, right, now we've made you immortal in symbol. I'm going to teach you all the things that lie ahead. I'm going to show you the scriptures of truth. John was told in Revelation chapter 10 that thou shalt prophesy yet again before many nations. And we will be given the plans for Armageddon, the plans for the conquest of the world, the detail of how the temple will be built, how the Jews will come back, how the world will be resettled. All the things we don't know about the kingdom shall be given into our hands. Because under the angels, God has not put in subjection the age to come. That's the work of the man of the one. It's the work of the perfected saint community. And we shall go through that process of glorification and reward with God. And so, brethren and sisters, let's just think about this vision of the man of the one over the river, the course of human history. Why is the earth here? Why did Jesus come Why has there been so much history of nations being pushed here and there on the earth? It's all because of the man of the one. It's all because God wants to bring out of this whole chaos of the 6,000 years of the kingdom of men a people prepared for his name. That's what it's about. And we are privileged to be called to be part of that man of the one and to share those immortal qualities, to go through the process that Daniel went through, that we might be there. But to get there, we must have the same desire as Daniel. From the first day, he set his heart to understand and to chasten himself before God, his words were heard. And our words will be similarly heard, brethren and sisters, if we pray for wisdom and we pray for understanding. And the wise, the truly wise, those who will be in the resurrection of the wise, they shall understand.